Coming up on Backyard Science, a fraction too much friction on the racetrack. We blast off with a homemade rocket launcher. And watch Water Walker Tightrope. Backyard Science goes camping, but what do you do when you've left the water bottle home? A lung busting, balloon blowing mystery. And gone off your greens? Here's how to grow your own salad. But first, there's no better way to get away from it all than to go camping. But there are a couple of rules to remember. Top of the list, don't, don't forget, forget the, the water. water. We're going camping on Jen's farm. Genevieve's an expert camper. She reckons our campsite is perfect. Now for something to eat. We've got enough stuff with everything but the kitchen sink. Plates, bowls, food, knives and forks, cups and something to drink. Hang on, where's the water? I can't find the water. What are we going to do? It's too late to go back. Looks like Genevieve has an idea. Oh no, I just remembered. That water's all salty. We can't drink that. What are we going to do? Yes, I think I've got it. We're going to have to dig our way out of this problem. Here in our backyard, we love balloon blowing up competitions. Go! Mine's the biggest. Oh, man, she always does that. I'm going to show her. Here, take this. Now I'm going to feed my balloon inside the neck of the bottle. And fold the balloon over the top. We're both going to do it. Come on, slow coach. This time, try blowing up the balloon inside the bottle, like this. She thinks she can win. No matter how hard she blows, she can't get that balloon any bigger. Try again. Now watch me again. Up she goes. A clear winner. I'd better let her into the secret. Mm -hmm. I don't like eating my greens. Let's face it, they're, well, green. And there's another problem. They taste nothing like chocolate. Worst of all, they're healthy. I know. There's a way to make your greens a bit more interesting. Grow your own. Get some seeds. Cress, lettuce or sprouts work well. Pop your seeds in a jar. Fill the jar with water and leave the seeds to soak. While you're waiting, take some cotton wool and lay it in a shallow dish. Pour on some more water, make it good and damp. Now, those seeds, tip them into a kitchen sieve. And sprinkle them onto the plate. Give them a spray. And leave them on a sunny windowsill for a couple of days. When you've come back, they should have started to sprout. Give them another spray. Do that every day. 
After a few more days, it should be big enough to eat. They won't taste any better, but at least they're a bit more fun. Oh, yum! A homegrown salad like that would certainly put a smile on my face. I think it's going to take more than a salad to put a smile on Genevieve and Daniela's face. They've got to find some water, and soon. Here we are on our camping trip without enough water. But I think there's water down here. But we have to take turns or we'll get too thirsty. And there's nothing to drink. Not yet, anyway. Aha! It's moisture down there. Have a feel, Jen. If we dig deep enough, maybe we'll find water. Water often gathers under the soil where you can't see it. It's called groundwater. How far down you have to dig depends on what's called the water table, the level at which the water gathers. Darn, no water here. But it looks like the hole has given Genevieve a new idea. What's she up to? Plastic? A bowl? Curious. She sent me off to get a stack of leaves. Oh yeah, makes sense. Trees send down roots to collect water, and leaves have water in them. Looks like Genevieve has got the solution. Everyone knows what happens when you drink a fizzy drink too fast. <laughs> Those bubbles are powerful little guys. That's nothing. I'm pretty sure I could beat that easily. All I need is a few bits and pieces to make some homemade bubbles. Vinegar, baking powder, raisins. Now, we start with a big glass jar. Half fill the jar with vinegar. Then add a teaspoon of baking soda. Whoa, Fizz City! Now let's put those bubbles to work. Drop in a coin. See if the bubbles can lift it. Hmm, too heavy. Not going anywhere. Maybe a grape. In it goes. Hey, it's working. Those bubbles pack a bit of punch. Not bad, eh? Raisins are lighter still. I'm going to try them. Here we go. Woohoo! They're bopping around all over the place. Yay, they look like they're dancing. The raisins have a rough surface that traps the bubbles. When there's enough trap, they lift the raisin up. When it touches the surface, the bubbles escape and the raisin sinks again. Then more bubbles form and the dancing starts all over. Oh yeah, those bubbles, they're powerful, all right? <laughs> Good on you, Sophie. Keep that burping practice coming along. Hey, why don't I show you how? No thanks, Jason. Save your breath. You might need it for blowing up balloons, like these guys. <laughs> blowing up a balloon is all about air pressure. Do it normally and there's more pressure in our lungs than outside. So the balloon goes up easily. But put the balloon inside a bottle and that changes. As the balloon goes up, it squeezes the air inside. And that balances the pressure in your lungs, you can't blow anymore. So how did I manage to do it? Ah, yes, well, it's all about a little hole. I made a small hole at the end of the bottle, so when I took my finger off the hole, some of the air inside the bottle could escape and the balloon inflated. But what about my sister? I was sneaky. I didn't put a hole in her bottle. Yay! <laughs> Big balloons like these aren't blown up by lung power. They're inflated as the gas-powered flame underneath the balloon heats the air. The hot air expands and stretches, filling the gigantic balloon. And because the heated air is lighter than the air outside, the balloon floats upwards. That's why these are called hot air balloons. If you want to float back to Earth quickly, just open a hole in the top of the balloon and the hot air escapes. Down to Earth you come.
Looking at colourful hot air balloons always seems to give me a lift. Oh dear, you're just like those balloons, Jason, full of hot air. But at least you're friendly, which is more than you can say for the pair of balloons we're about to meet. These balloons may seem like the best of friends, but it doesn't take much to turn them against each other. They look happy now, but watch this. I just rubbed the red one on my hair. Ho oh, ho! Feel that static electricity. And the red one tries to get as far away from the green one as it can. When Joseph rubs the red balloon on his hair, it becomes charged with static electricity. It's the opposite electric charge to the doorway. Opposites attract, and so the balloon clings to the wood. I wonder what happens if we charge up the green balloon. You rub it on your hair. It's trying to be friendly to the red one, but then... Oh no! It's so charged up, it just can't resist that doorway either. I guess that's the end of a beautiful friendship. We weren't able to dig far enough down to get groundwater, but the hole might do the trick yet. We're putting the leaves into the hole. Now put our plastic container in the hole, surround it with all those leaves. Now we put our plastic sheet over the hole. Anchor it down with some dirt around the edges. And put a small rock in the middle over the container. And now we just have to wait. I wonder if we've collected any water yet. Yes, there's some in there. Genevieve was right. As the leaves get hot, the water evaporates from them. Then it condenses as soon as it reaches the cooler plastic above. Then it drips down into the container. Jen deserves the first taste. Looks like it's good. Mmm, it doesn't taste leafy at all. At least we know we won't die of thirst. <laughs> cool, look at them go. Awesome. Oh no, we're in trouble. That was one cool speed wobble. Okay, into the pitch race bench where we're going to try out a little idea of mine. I want to know what makes the fastest track. Surface is all important, but exactly why? So first things first, we need a test track. Take a large piece of board and using thumbtacks, start hammering in lanes. They all need to be the same length and width. Now form rubber band barriers. track. Now for a test run. Ben, you clock the speeds. Over a second for our smooth track. Alright, now this track is ready for some real action. Genevieve and I have run out of fun stuff to do these holidays. Cheer up. How about one of my party favourites? Touch your nose, then each finger on your left hand with your right index finger. Easy. Now for the good part. Ta-da! Put this on and we'll see what happens. You ready? Okay, you can't see anything? First, put your left hand up in the air. Now put your right hand finger on your nose. Now make that finger touch each one of the fingers on that hand. Whoop, not quite. Missed. And you're very slow. Sorry, I shouldn't laugh. It's really not as easy as you think. I'll have a go. Our brain works like a computer, analysing information to give us a sense of movement and body awareness. 
This comes from nerve endings known as proprioceptors. While they work automatically, we also rely on visual clues. That's why it's a challenge when blindfolded. Stop it! I don't look that funny, do I? <laughs> Time for our homemade stomp rocket to blast off into outer space. Stop a bolt blaster. First, we'll show you how this mission started. To make a stomp rocket, you need paper rolled into a cylinder. It's easy if you wrap it around a rod. Tape the top tightly so no air can escape. Now cut out three triangles for the rocket fins and connect the two parts. But this rocket will be grounded without something to send it skyward. So to make a rocket launcher, take some plastic tubing and push it into a plastic bottle. Tape it up securely. Now join the two. Okay, time for liftoff. Stomping on the bottle causes a rapid increase in air pressure in the bottle. That air pushes through the bottle's opening propelling the rocket upwards. A rocket's pointy nose cone is designed to minimise the amount of air it has to push aside in order to move forwards as it hurtles deep into space. Go boldly, Stomp Rocket. May the force be with you. Okay, Ben and I have timed the smooth track. Now we want to see what happens to the speed when we put different stuff on the surface. First up, we'll spread some glue onto the board and then sprinkle on some sand. Nearly three seconds. That's a lot slower than the smooth track. Now for a really rough ride, glue on some pebbles. Hang in there, beast. More than three seconds. Hey, speed fiend. Wait till you see what happens when we throw this into the mix. It's definitely a boy thing. Any excuse to tear up the track. You'll never get it done, but let's not go there. Time now to throw on a beanie and take a trip to the snow. We better be on high alert today. Kurt and his gang are after revenge for last week's snowball wars. I hope we can hear them coming. Everything sounds so muffled after fresh snowfall. That's probably because there's lots of air between the flakes. And it absorbs sound like a big pillow. Shh! Can you hear anything? I have a really bad feeling about today. They're after revenge in a big way. Quick, we're under attack! Ouch! That was a killer snowball. Some snow is better for making snowballs than others. It depends on the temperature and the amount of air between the flakes. Perfect snowballs need to be made with snow that is densely packed and just starting to melt so it can be shaped into an icy missile. Okay, it's payback time. We'll be poised for a real warrior war when those guys attack next time. Start by packing the snow hard into plastic containers. By doing this, we have excellent building blocks for a snow wall. Great! This snow fort will give us the perfect advantage. Keep down though. Now we're perfectly protected. All we have to do is jump up and fight when they attack. Oh no! They've got us! Oh man, we just didn't count on them coming in from behind. Right, if you can do 
you. We open them up in our faces, and whoever gets the wettest loses. Hope you're enjoying your sticky shower. Okay, my turn. Uh, not a problem. And not one bit wet. Okay, double or nothing. This beats going to the gym. Poor Ty doesn't know about my secret weapon. A dozen taps and that should be enough. Tapping the can makes the bubbles rise to the top to form one big bubble instead of staying in the liquid, making it spray everywhere when the pressure is released. Cheers. Ah, it's time for Priscilla to take a break with a refreshing glass of water. I bet she thinks there's only one way to pour water. Well, just watch what I'm up to. You'll need scissors and a glass of water. Cut the string and attach it to the handle of the jug, then give it a good soak. Next, thread the other end into your glass and prepare to be amazed. She looks worried, but she'll just have to trust me, because I won't spill a drop. There you have it. Water the walk to tightrope. Pretty cool, eh? Water molecules like to stick together. They're attracted to each other like small magnets. The water molecules in the wet string encourage the water being poured to follow their path straight into the glass. Now that's a drop poured with a difference. Hey, it was clean string. Oh, there's no pleasing some people. I know. I thought that was the most impressive glass of water ever poured. And while we're in the mood to be impressed, let's fast track it back to Ben and John's raceway. Well, we've seen how the beast handles a smooth, sandy and bumpy surface. So now let's try out some slippery conditions. Under a second. So far, that's our fastest time. And lastly, imagine if it started to get frosty. Okay, two seconds. Right, our time trials are over. Now let's see them in an action replay. In lane one, on the smooth surface, we clocked in at over a second. In lane two, on the sand, it took nearly three seconds. Lane 3 was our cross country, which took over 3 seconds. Lane 4 was the oil slip, clocking in with a crash at just under a second. And in lane 5, our ice track coming in at 2 seconds. So the oily track gave us our fastest time, and our pebbles the slowest. I guess the pebbles held the beast back. And as for the oil, I'm not sure it was a good thing. My car spun out of control. That's because there wasn't any friction between the track and the tyres. Friction is an invisible force that holds things back when two uneven surfaces rub together. It's sort of like nature's seatbelt, because it works to restrain movement. Like when a car brakes and the tyres grip the road. The less friction there is, the faster things move. And now there's nothing holding us back as we break out with a bit of friendly friction. And they had buckets of fun along the way. And so have we. But sadly, all good things must come to an end. So, see, see you next time. time.